on the 31st day of October, Halloween gave to me 31 Dancing Witches, 30 Hotel Ghost Hunters, 29 Veteran Seancing, 28 Whispering Walls, 27 Slugs of Slinking, 26 Hot Dog Ghosts, 25 Hitchhiking Ghouls, 24 Soggy Corpses, 23 Shadows Creeping, 22 Egyptian Eyeballs, 21 Acid Raves, 20 Creepy Stalkers, 19 Kiernan's Time Traveling, 18 Zombie Swatting, 17 Kegner Screeching, 16 Flying Engines, 15 Workplace Accidents, 14 Logs of Bouncing, 13 Planes Exploding, 12 Zombie Soldiers, 11 Angels Wrestling, 10 Ghostly Hitchhikers, 9 Basement Clowns, 8 Vampire Cruises, 7 Silent Heroes, 6 Prequel Bloodstones, five diabolical fledglings, four vampire pianists, three dead professors, two Michelle actresses, and a radu drooling something bloody. Well, hey there, everyone. How you doing? Happy Halloween. Here it is. The big day at last. Oh, goodness. It has been quite a journey. Uh, If you have been listening to all of these episodes, God bless you. Thank you for doing so. Uh, If you haven't, if you're picking and choosing and decide to check in on the Halloween episode, how dare you? Who needs you? Sorry. uh, Sometimes I get a little self-possessed and uh, it's it's not your fault. It's me. It's not you. It's me. Um, But here it is. Halloween. I'm so excited to be talking about uh, a banger of a movie. And it may seem obvious, like, I don't go for the, you know, mystery behind the Halloween door. Here's an obscure Dutch movie you've never heard of. I don't do that. On Halloween, I watch something that I think is legitimately great. And the reason I wanted to talk about Suspiria this year is because for a long time, I didn't necessarily think Suspiria was all that great. I was wrong. I was, uh, I was a dumb, dumb person filled with dumb ideas. Uh, as a, a friend of mine is, is fond of saying, I had shit in my head. And <laughs> I have corrected that. Uh, when I watched this again for th- uh, this recording, and uh, I watched it on the Criterion Channel stream, which is both a director's cut for whatever that's worth. I, don't, I didn't see anything that was drastically different in this version of it. Uh, Or maybe I've just only ever seen the director's cut. Who's to say? But it was as good as this movie has ever looked. It's the best quality version of the film I have ever watched. There's something in my head that associates Suspiria with (laughs) that sort of, you know, like 380p kind of look. And I think maybe the first time I ever saw it, like I downloaded it on LimeWire. Or maybe it was all broadcast via... Uh, smoke signals or something. But I remember this movie, like the color palette stood out for sure. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But the movie itself did not look that clean. And so watching it again in this format, in a way that looked as good as I've ever seen the movie looking, was really special. And I liked the movie before. Don't get me wrong. I've, I had come around on Suspiria prior to seeing it this time. However, I had not seen the movie look this sharp and this clean and this gorgeous. And so my appreciation for Suspiria is now much greater than it was even before I watched it again, having already selected it as this is the movie I want to talk about for, for Halloween. And let's talk about the movie then. And most of you have seen Suspiria. If you haven't seen Suspiria, hey, you ought to watch Suspiria. It's pretty damn good. But if you've never seen Suspiria, it the story is fairly simple. So let, let's get that out of the way right now. The story is a, a young woman, played by Jessica Harper, is going to go to this dance academy in Berlin. And on arriving there, weird shit starts to happen. People are dying. And by the end of the movie, she is caught up in a conspiracy that may or may not involve witches. Spoilers, it totally involves witches. And that's it. That's the whole story. This is not a Dario Argento film that relies heavily on plot. This is, if ever there was one, a vibes movie. And let's break down what makes this vibe so good. One, the music. 
I love this soundtrack. This is one of my favorite horror soundtracks. I'm a big fan of Goblin. I'm a big fan of Claudio Simonetti. There's something about these Italian horror movie scores that really does it for me. I listen to, this isn't my favorite, probably the soundtrack for Tenebrae, the score for Tenebrae is my absolute favorite piece of movie music. I think that's right. I, I'm trying to argue with myself even as I say that and decide, is that true? What about the music from Jaws? I really love that, particularly that adventure music when they're out on the water and chasing the shark. I really like that a lot. But Tenebrae may be it. However, Suspiria is awfully damn good. And the music, like, it lets you know right off the top, I don't know why I'm saying, like, spoilers, there are witches. Because as soon as the music starts in this movie, you are treated to an Italian prog rock band whisper shouting, witch, at you, uh, along with all the other soothing tones. I love it. I love the Suspiria uh, score. Goblin is one of my favorite, you know, soundtrack artists. And I think... When I'm thinking about movie music, a lot of people will talk about John Carpenter. And John Carpenter is great, but John Carpenter is utilitarian. His music is stripped down. It's very simple. That doesn't make it bad, but it doesn't hit me the same way that Goblin does. I think John Carpenter's music's incredible, and for his movies, they are just right. There is no better soundtrack to a John Carpenter movie than a John Carpenter score, unless, of course, you're talking about Ennio Morricone doing the score for The Thing, which is the best John Carpenter score that John Carpenter never did. Uh, we're not here to talk about John Carpenter, though. We're here to talk about Goblin and Suspiria. It's incredible. Every step of the way, the music creates this sense of chaos and terror, and it's just cool. Goblin is just cool. There's no getting around it. I play it at school all the time when uh, the kids are doing independent work and I throw in a little music to, to go on behind them. And I'll play some Goblin and they're like, what is this? And I'm like, Italian prog rock and shut up. I say it like that and then I give them a little shove. I'm like, you want to make something of it? <laughs> anyway, that's what I do with uh, high school children. But I love the, the score, so that's out of the way. Let's talk about the colors, of course. It is, of course, all shot in Technicolor, and it's vibrant and beautiful and gruesome. And the one knock you can levy against this movie, if you want to be a jerk, is how red and garish and theatrical the blood appears in this film. And I would argue that is a style choice more than it is some limitation of budget or imagination. This, the blood in this movie is bright, bright red, and I love it. I love the fact that it doesn't look like real blood, but I love it nonetheless. And it's gorgeous. The whole movie, cover to cover, the reds and the blues and the purples and uh, you know the wallpaper that is all velour and, and, and fabric, and you think, boy, all of these people smoking in this place... Those walls have to reek of stale cigarette smoke. And that's perfect. That's exactly what Suspiria ought to smell like. Uh, stale cigarette smoke and coppery blood and perhaps uh, just a, a hint of paprika. That is what <laughs> Suspiria ought to smell like. And so that's music, that's color. And the performances are fine. That is one of the least interesting things to me about Suspiria. I don't know that I necessarily care that much. I mean, Jessica Harper is totally fine in it. Uh, Stefania Cassini as Sarah is fine in it. Uh, Alida Valley as Miss Tanner and Joan Bennett as Madame Blanc. Like, all of these performances are good, and they do exactly what you need them to do. I don't know that any are mind-blowing. It's not like, you know, the performance that we talked about from Influencer where there is one performer that steals the show and walks away with it and becomes the reason that you ought to see this. The reason you ought to see this is because of Argento. 
And it's what Argento does. And we might as well get into that. What Argento does in this movie is from Jump creates this sense that you as a viewer are stepping into a different world. Case in point, when Jessica Harper lands at the airport and outside the door is a storm. And within the confines of the airport, everything is calm and sedate. And as soon as the door opens up, it's like somebody stuck a microphone in a hurricane. It is just swirling wind and noise and rain. And the goblin score is shrieking. And then the door closes and like all of that stops. And you're like, oh, so the movie is out there. It's, a, it's outside the door. As soon as she goes outside the door, she'll walk right into the movie. And that's what happens. She walks out the door into the movie, into this rainstorm, you know, with an asshole cab driver taking her to the dance academy. And I like the fact that, uh, and I'll get the name wrong, but it's like, you know, it's Esser Strassen and, or Esser Strassen. And she keeps saying it. He's like, what? Esser Strassen. And he's what? And she finally hands him the paper. And he, which by the way, the, when Argento frames it, it's out of focus. You just, you're focused on Jessica Harper, not the name of the place. And the taxi driver looks back and goes, Oh, Esther Strassen. Why didn't you say so? And you're like, Oh, this guy's a real asshole. But getting back to why Argento makes this movie, uh, not what, what it, what his impulse was to create the movie, but why it's, it's him. It's Argento himself. That is the reason to watch this film. It's that sense of the fabulous, the the fantasy of it, that, you know, the death scene of seeing this woman's heart get a knife plunged into it and the opening kills and the floating eyes outside her window and the long, long burn leading up to the dog attacking its master, the, the blind pianist. And even before that, having that moment where he's at this, you know, German pub and they're doing the dance on the tables and this blind guy is just there listening to people fake slap each other. And all of that, it, it lends to this feeling of the surreal that everything is happening inside a storybook and up to and including the end of the movie. The end is sort of abrupt and, and somewhat nonsensical. And I, you can make the argument, I think, that either Jessica Harper, Susie Bannon in the film, Banyan, either she destroys the school, ends up burning it down, and when she leaves and is laughing and is calm, that she is laughing out of a sense of relief, that she has brought down this evil that she was forced to confront. The other side of that is that you can make the argument that all of this was geared toward her becoming a vessel for the, you know, the directress of the school, the, this all powerful witch. And that is something that certainly the remake leaned heavily into, but I think you can make the argument that this movie does the same thing. It makes the same move, but in a way that is not, as obvious which is fine and I think the fact that it's open to a little bit of interpretation makes the end of this movie more interesting and on the way there there's a lot of twists and turns everything from this sort of hulking oafish guy that has this incredible smile on account of him getting his teeth replaced which I think is very funny but all of this stuff like you can argue well, this guy is sort of the troll of your movie. That he is this character that represents something else from a fairy tale. We've already got witches. And we've got, you know, these innocents who have come to uh, this place. And all of that stuff is uh, of a stripe. That it feels like it is this dark fairy tale that is being told to us. And... I absolutely adore that sense of unreality and the sense that you can't really trust all of your senses. Uh, you, you're, 
you know, at the whim of these witches who are manipulating the reality around you just as they are for Susie, um, a.k.a. Jessica Harper. And all of that leads to a sense that you never exactly know where the movie's going to go. You can't really second guess it if you've never seen it before. And then once you have seen it, it's really making a piece with the sense that this is never going to be fully narratively satisfying. There are drop threads all over the place. Like Susie's relationship with this guy that hangs around the dance Academy and maybe they like each other and maybe they don't. None of that really matters. And it feels like it, it was a thing that was going to be in the movie and then wasn't. So uh, whatever, what are you going to do? Uh, but I like all of that. I like all of that stuff and making peace with it and understanding that you're not going to have that narrative satisfaction means that you can appreciate all the little details even more. And I love all the little details of this movie. I like that sense of danger that you always feel a sense that nothing is ever completely certain, which is exactly where you want to be in a movie like this, in a movie that is about you know, witches and witchcraft and, and as they describe themselves being characters, uh, well, the not describe themselves when, when we have our professors, our experts come in to deliver some exposition and talk about how witches are there for their own personal gain and will manipulate and destroy and corrupt in an effort to get that. And, you know, Inferno I, as a follow up, I think is very good. Mother of Tears, I've only seen one time, and I remember feeling really bored by it. I should go back and revisit Mother of Tears just to do it, just to give it one more day in court and, and see if I, my opinion of it has changed at all. But Suspiria stands on its own. Those are, you know, spiritual sequels and spiritual uh, associations uh, with this film. Suspiria is completely dreamlike and wonderful, and having seen it in such a pristine fashion, it looks incredible, it sounds incredible, everything about it just captivates me. It's like a dream. For 98 minutes, you fall into this dream that Argento has created for you, and then at the end of it, you wake up to a, a rock and goblin score and are left to ponder what happened to you, but along the way, you, you are left with these images kind of frozen in your brain of Jessica Harper running down this blue and purple and red lit hallway with curtains billowing or the silhouette of the directress behind a sheet and seeing only the shadows or the woman in the, you know, razor wire writhing around as she's cut and bloody. Like all of these things, the, the, the dog attacking its master, all of those things are things that are sort of seared into your brain if you've seen this movie a time or two because there's just nothing else like it and maybe that's the best thing you can say about Suspiria is there has never been anything like it even the remake of it had to go a completely different direction and I think it's great I think the, the remake of Sus Suspiria is fantastic but it has to do a different thing it can't pretend to be an Argento movie because only Argento can be Argento and at this point in his career, I'm not even sure Argento can be Argento anymore. Uh, but that's okay, because the, the work that he's left us is really striking, really amazing stuff. So uh, that is my recommendation for you on this Halloween. If it's been a while, hey, man, kick on Suspiria. Uh, dip your hand in that bucket of candy. Uh, grab some M&Ms or some Reese's Pieces. Maybe a, a cold, delicious glass of milk. Sit down with Suspiria and the one you love and just let that movie happen to you and enjoy that fairy tale. Enjoy that dream for a little while. You know, Halloween in many ways is that thing, right? It is It is one big dream that we all collectively share where one day we put on masks and pretend to be something other than ourselves and that kind of rules. And that's one of the reasons I love it so much and, and that's why I think Suspiria is a great pairing with that notion, that philosophy of being compl not quite ourselves for a little while, not quite a movie for a little while. It's a, Suspiria is less a, a, a narrative movie than it is this artistic experience. But it's also really creepy and scary and wonderful, and hearts get stabbed right in front of you. And that woman 
uh, plunging through the glass and the the snap of her neck when the rope pulls taut. Again, there are things that will never leave you. So yeah, that's it, Suspiria. Enjoy, everyone. Uh, hey, thanks so much for taking this ride with me this year. It has been a great deal of fun. I will certainly do it next year. Lord Willen and the Creek Don't Rise, as they say. And I'll be back with more Dark Parade stuff in the very near future. So uh, I hope that you stick around for that stuff as well. I mean, hey, folks, let's be real. There's a whole new Hell House LLC movie to pick apart. So don't kid yourself. I'm going to be watching that, and i got to talk about it on Dark Parade. Otherwise, it's like it never happened. Anyway, more of that, more Heart of Horror, all that stuff. More of that coming very soon, I promise you. Uh, and and have the happiest of Halloweens. Thank you so much for being part of this, for being part of the Dark Parade, for being part of Legion Podcast, wherever it is that you find your, your ghoulish joy this year. Uh, embrace it. Enjoy it. Uh, the Halloween season is all too fleeting, as we know by this being the end of it, the, the 31st day of Halloween. So savor it like a delicious caramel apple. And I'll see you soon on the Dark Parade, and I'll see you next year for another 31 days of Halloween. See you then, everybody. Bye.